Hello, everybody. My name is Gilda Ross. I'm the Glenbard Student and Community Projects Coordinator. This is a first for the Glenbard Parent Series. It's our 28th year. This is the first time that we are welcoming um, to a virtual event only a distinguished Glenbard alum. And I couldn't be more excited about the fact that Liz Fosleen is the one who's making that history making moment. Her books are not to be missed, Big Feelings, No Hard Feelings. As I look at this book and as I look at the drawings, each new page, I find a favorite. And I know you will too. And I couldn't be more excited about tonight. I'm so glad that you're here. Uh, we've got some students, they were invited to join us and uh, they took a look at the programming and they said, this is the one that we want to be a part of. So I'm so excited that we have three Glenbard North students who are helping us put this program on tonight. We have Sophie, we have Shannon, we have Haley, um, and you'll hear from them in just a minute. Uh, we couldn't do this without the sponsors who make GPS possible. You saw the slides of our annual sponsors and all of our community partners. We thank them and we thank you for the gift of your time. Our ask is to please share this resource. The Glenbard Parent Series is for everyone everywhere, families across the street or across the country. Uh, we encourage you to like us on Facebook and uh, again, please do share. Um, before we begin, I very quickly want to tell you about some of the events that are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Next week, we will be welcoming the author of the book Queen Bees and Wannabes. She'll be, that is Rosalind Wiseman. She'll be back to talk about the inevitable ups and downs of teen relationships. That will be next Tuesday, the 11th at noon and at 7 p.m. And then the next week, we are going to be welcoming for the first time Dr. John Spencer. He'll be talking about empowering students with the skills of tomorrow. Also on Tuesday, April 18th, 7 p.m. only. And then uh, our next speaker will be um, Dr. Uh, Eric Fisher. He will be talking about his book, The Urge, A Personal Story of Struggle. Talk. He's an addiction psychiatrist. He'll be talking about his own addiction and he will be with us on April 26th on Wednesday at 7 p.m p.m. and also at noon. Uh, we've added some new programming, so I urge you to go to the website um, and you'll see what is coming up. And now with further ado, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome here tonight uh, a regular actually, that's Haley, who's a senior at Glumbard North. So Haley, take it away. Thank you, Ms. Ross. Shannon, Sophie, and I are here in our role as DuPage Action Team Student Ambassadors. As DuPage Action Team leaders, we partner with the Prevention Leadership Team, the PLT of the DuPage County Health Department, Serenity House, as well as NAMI DuPage. We work for substance use prevention, mental health wellness, and as stigma reduction peer support ambassadors within the Glenbard North within all the Glenbard school communities. We do this to reduce stigma associated with substance use and mental wellness. At the conclusion of this program, we will share several opportunities available to all DuPage County High School students to become involved as well. Now I'll hand it over to Sophie for our introduction. Thank you, Haley. And now it's my honor to introduce tonight's speaker. Liz Fosleen is the author and illustrator of the national bestseller, Big Feelings, and the Wall Street Journal bestseller, No Hard Feelings, which had both, both been translated into 15 languages, and the head of content and communications at HUMU. As an expert on emotions at work, Liz regularly trains leaders at, at the Fortune 500 on how to develop high-performing, inclusive teams. Her work has been featured by Good Morning America, The Economist, TED, The New York Times, NPR, Harvard Business Review, and The Financial Times. Ms. Fosleen was selected as a Glenbird West alum for the 2022 and 2023 school year, and we are delighted to welcome her here tonight to the Glenbird Parent Series. Thank you, Sophie. Um, that was a great introduction. And yeah, thank you everyone for being here today. Let me share my screen. Um, great. Yeah. So 
I am Liz Vosling. Um, as mentioned, I'm the head of content and communications at a company called Humu. We help organizations improve every single week. Um, so I help leaders and their teams take the seemingly small actions that have a really big impact on how they feel at work. Um, I'm also, as was mentioned, a very proud alum of Glenbard West. Um, I graduated in 2005, so I'm going to date myself, uh, but um, I'm just very excited to be here and hopefully give something back to the community. Um, after that, I went to Pomona College. Um, so questions about that, you can always reach out if there's anyone who, you know, went there, has an association, just wanted to also name that. Um, and then I thought it'd be useful to share a little bit about how I got here, um, speaking to you today about emotions at work, in life, some of the harder things that we go through. Um, and I share this because when I was in high school, I think, I know, not think, I know I felt very lost and I thought that I just needed to be on this path in life. And so I would go to college, I would get my job, and then I would have to like advance on this career and I needed to have everything figured out. Um, and now I've been in the work world for about 15 years, which is wild to say, but I can confidently tell you that you do not need to have everything figured out. Um, and so I want to kind of share my first entry into the work world as an example of that, which is, so I went to college and I studied math and economics. Um, I wanted to get like a good quantitative degree that would set me up for success. And then I went to work at a company called Analysis Group, which is a consulting firm. And that first job out of college really felt to me like it had everything that a successful job should have. I went into a tall building. I put on a suit. Um, it had a big view. Like it just, I felt important and like I had made it. Um, and I really burnt out of that job after two years. So I think there were a couple of things that were going on. One was the hours were extremely long. The work was not creative, which I found that I actually really love. Um, but I also, looking back, I didn't know that you could figure out what you like to do at work, that you could go to your manager and have a conversation and say something like, these are the parts of my job that I love. Can I invest more in this? Are there growth opportunities in these areas? And what roles might help me do more of that and move more away from the things that I don't like as much? Um, but I didn't know any of that. I thought that to be a professional, you couldn't fail, you couldn't fuss, and you certainly, certainly could not feel. Uh, and so I think that was a huge detriment to me. So I basically started getting really bad headaches and had to quit after about two years. I had no idea what I wanted to do next. And so as a consultant, I had been going to the Starbucks around the corner three times a day to get coffee and basically escape the office. <laughs> And so what I did is I went to that Starbucks, I quit my consulting job, I walked downstairs, I walked around the corner and walked into the Starbucks where they knew me as a customer. And I said, I don't have a job. I need some income. Can I be a barista here? So I applied and interviewed and was lucky enough to get that job. And I really thought of that job initially as sort of just like a place to be while I figured out what I wanted to do next. And it actually ended up shaping the rest of my career. Um, so Starbucks, I'm not paid or sponsored by Starbucks. I just genuinely found this interesting. Starbucks is very intentional about the way that they onboard employees. So when you start, you're really quickly thrown into this kind of chaotic environment where you have people coming into the store in the morning. I had the morning shift. They haven't had their coffee yet. They're on their way to work. They really want their coffee. And so it's really fast paced. There's all these different things to think about. And so Starbucks has to really quickly help people learn how to work together and how to do the work. And so they were in such intentionality on how they helped people do that. They've also thought so much about the stores. So if you've ever been to a Starbucks, sometimes they have round tables and those are purposely there so that you can sit there by yourself and not feel like there's three edges or three sides where there's not people sitting with you. You can feel comfortable being there alone or bringing as many people as you want to this round table. They've thought about how the lighting changes throughout the day, the music, and fundamental to both employees and customers at Starbucks is just emotions and helping people feel a certain way, feel like they belong there, feel like they have a home there. And so again, just to emphasize, like for any of you who are watching, who feel lost or like are in high school and maybe feel that way, 
you are going to have many experiences in life. Some of them will be great. Some of them will be really hard. And there's something to learn from all of them and just be open to what you can learn along the way. Um, my career has had many <laughs> different turns since then even. And I would say all of those, I really benefited from just being open to what I might be able to learn there and where it might take me. Um, and so it took me essentially that experience of both realizing that I couldn't suppress my emotions, that I had to listen to what I enjoyed, how I felt at work, and then combined with seeing when you really think about how to craft an environment, how to help people feel good in a space, that led me to co-author this book with my friends called No Hard Feelings. Um, this came out in 2019, and the fundamental premise is that though we often think that having feelings, especially at work, makes you weak or irrational or unprofessional, it actually just makes you human. Um, and this is also a message that I really wish that I had heard in high school. Uh, I also, you know, it's like, it's a wild time in your life, at least for me. I came from kind of, I moved to Glombard West. I didn't know that many people. And so that was really intimidating. And I really beat myself up at the time for having a hard time navigating a new environment. Um, and so I think just having people in your life, even if it's me on Zoom saying, it's totally fine to feel feelings if you're having a hard time, that's okay. People have hard times in life. Things do get better. Um, the next day you might even feel better. And I'm going to go through some of those tips for how to feel better. Uh, I think that's a really important and powerful message. The second book uh, that I co-authored is called Big Feelings and really looks at some of the tougher emotions that we face in life. So often we don't talk about these emotions, whether it's at work or at school or even at home with our parents and with our loved ones. Um, but sometimes people are really carrying heavy things and they don't feel safe opening up. So how can we create an environment where they feel safer, where we feel more comfortable, um, even if it's not to everyone, just finding one person that we trust and starting the process of recovery. Um, I've worked with all these different companies. So really um, emphasizing again, that these big emotions like anxiety, like despair, like uncertainty, um, perfectionism, some of the things I'll cover today, they come up in kind of any organization you can think of, and they definitely come up in schools as well. So today I'm going to go through how to learn from some of our difficult emotions, how to overcome perfectionism, navigate uncertainty, combat burnout, and then there's time at the end for some questions. So it's a lot and I have about, I think 30 minutes left. So I'm gonna dig right in. But if there's questions, um, feel free to pop those in the chat as we go along. I would love to get to those at the end. So the first piece of this is just list learning from difficult emotions. And I think again, the biggest thing I wanna emphasize here is it starts with giving yourself permission and not beating yourself up for feeling whatever you're feeling. Emotions are very normal. They're a natural response to stimuli. And so it's really important that we just accept that we have them and don't make ourselves feel bad for feeling bad because that will only make you feel worse. So when you're feeling something big, um, pause. So first, don't suppress it, don't ignore it, don't do all these mental gymnastics to pretend you're not feeling it because that's really what's gonna allow you to acknowledge what you're feeling and then really understand where that feeling is coming from. Um, and then you can explore the best path forward. So questions to ask, let's say that you're feeling very anxious. You might say, what exactly am I feeling? And one resource that I love, you can Google this. Um, you're, I'm, Gilda, you're free to share the slides afterwards. This is an emotions wheel. And so I didn't come up with this, but I think this is a really valuable tool in pinpointing exactly what you're feeling. So I think often when we don't have the vocabulary, we just stop at like, I feel bad or I feel happy. And what's hard about that is that it's harder to, to figure out like why you feel that or what need is being unaddressed. So here you can say like, I feel bad, but actually it's tired and I feel unfocused, which is different than sleepy. Um, so if you feel unfocused, it might be that you actually just need to figure out what are your top priorities, invest in those. If you're sleepy, you might just need a good night's sleep. So really important to pinpoint exactly what it is you're feeling, because that allows you to figure out what's driving it. So again, if I say I'm really anxious, it might be because I have a big test tomorrow. And that's useful to know. So what's the underlying need? I need to feel more secure that I'm going to do okay on this test. Um, and the next steps that I can take is maybe I need to study, uh, maybe I need to ask for help, 
Maybe I need to ask a friend to quiz me on some things. But again, it's the process of what is this emotion? Where is it coming from? What can I do to alleviate it? And then really breaking that down into specific steps to take. So that leads into perfectionism. Um, and so signs of perfectionist tendencies. And again, I want to emphasize here that this is based both on research, but it's also based very much on my experience. Um, so I would de describe myself as a recovering perfectionist. Um, and here are some of the things that I used to really struggle with and honestly still do sometimes. So the first is you feel unable to shut off. So if you go to bed at night, you're just, you have mental checklists, you're running through those checklists. You just don't feel like you ever stop thinking about all the things you need to do. And this can be work. This can be school. This can also just be like, maybe, you, you know, we play many roles in our lives. So we're maybe taking care of loved ones. We're taking care of our younger siblings. Um, so often it's just like, you feel like you're just cycling through all the things that are on your plate and it feels overwhelming. You never feel good about what you've done. So your self-confidence is kind of like a bucket with a hole in it. You do stuff, you invest in things, and then it feels like momentarily good, but the next day you wake up and you're just like, okay, I need to do more, or I need to show up in this specific way because there's no sustainable, like I actually feel confident that I am enough. You also feel like anything you do needs to be perfect before you can show it to anyone. So if you're like working on a draft, I remember this very vividly in high school, I'd work on a draft and I didn't feel like I could even share it with anyone to look at it, or I would like just think about it so much and obsess over it before I could turn it in. And that's again, the sign that it's like an unhealthy obsession with being perfect. And part of that often shows up as procrastination. So a big, big misconception around procrastination is that it's because someone is lazy. And I've seen so many people tell themselves this of like, yes, I do have a problem. Like sometimes it's really hard for me to finish something or get started on something or just finally turn it in. And that means I'm a lazy person. It means I'm a bad person. It definitely, definitely doesn't mean that. It's usually just a sign that there's an underlying emotion that you're not addressing. And so that's often fear. Often you're just overwhelmed. You don't know where to start. Perfectionism plays a big role here. Or often you feel like you even deserve to like throw your name in the hat. Um, you don't deserve to like be in a certain space. And so that holds you back. So the big thing here, like I will get to how to start to address some of the fears that you see in the bottom circle, but it's not laziness. Like it's almost never ever laziness when I see procrastination show up. And this is also something I lead a team in my job. And if someone's like not turning something in or they're taking a really long time, longer than I expected on an assignment, I will actually say like, you know, what's going on here? Like, I'd love to explore this. What's holding you back? And often, again, it's that they just didn't know how to get started or that they just are worried about what I'm going to think of their first draft. One of the most destructive aspects of perfectionism is that it prevents us from practicing what academics called self-compassion. So it really gets in the way of us treating ourselves like we would treat a friend. So often when I ask people, like, what would you say to a friend in this situation? Their answer is really different than what they're telling themselves. So we say to ourselves, like, you're lazy, you're not good at this. And to a friend, we say like, hey, you're just having a hard time, or you don't know how to do this yet, and you can learn. So it's really different. And perfectionism is what keeps us from treating ourselves like we treat our best friends. Um, and by obsessing too much, it also actually hinders our performance. So there's research that shows, and this was done with athletes, that athletes who obsess so much about doing everything perfect every single time, they choke when it matters. And so instead of like enjoying it, seeing mistakes as learning opportunities, they just get so nervous about making a mistake and not living up to what they see as like their perfect potential that they don't perform as well as they could. Um, so perfectionism at its core is not about achieving perfection. And this is another big myth that I see is that we think of perfectionists as these like amazing, successful people that have color-coded binders and everything in their life is immaculate. And it's actually usually not, those people exist, but it's not that they're being driven by like, I'm going to be the best. It's that they have a deep, deep fear of failing in any way because they don't believe that they are enough. 
So I would say the difference between like healthy striving, trying to achieve something that's great and being a perfectionist is like, if you get, let's say a 95% on a test, a healthy striver would say a 95% is a really good grade. Um, and yeah, I made a mistake. There was one question I didn't get. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to learn for next time, but I feel really good about my accomplishment. A perfectionist is going to say, I got a 95%. Why didn't I get that last 5%? Why did I miss that last question? And so you can see how those are two really different mindsets, really different reactions to the same situation, which like anyone else would say is a really good grade. And so the first part of moving through this, of starting to recover from perfectionism, and I say recover, like it's not that you can just flip a switch and you're never going to be a perfectionist again. I still have moments when it's, I find myself sort of sinking into a lot of the behaviors that I just described. But one really fundamental part is that doing well at anything is an error prone process. So you're never going to learn how to do something well if you don't understand what you should not do, right? So making mistakes instead of seeing those as like signs that you're not good at something see those as opportunities to learn what you shouldn't do or to learn like hey what could I do to improve next time like now I'm starting again but this time I have experience and I know that I'm going to do something a little differently and so questions to ask yourself when you like let's say that a lot of us resonated and you find yourself in these perfectionist mentalities the first question is to ask yourself, when did I learn to set this expectation? So where in your life was there a person, was there a moment, was there sort of a series of interactions that made you feel like you needed to do a lot of stuff to be loved, to be enough, to be cared about, to be accepted? Um, I've spoken with many people, so I interviewed about 1,200 people for the second book, and a lot of people talked about like their parents being really hard on them when they got a bad grade or being in a relationship early on where they just didn't feel completely accepted. And so they just worked really hard. Like maybe if I try and try and try, I'll be accepted. And it all comes back to learning at some point in your life or believing that you have to like perform in a certain way to be loved. And then the next question is, what do you want or need if you could shed that expectation? So if you just said like, I'm enough and like the people that maybe are in my head often, if I just put them to the side, if I get rid of everything I think I should be, who do I want to be? And I think that's a really interesting question to explore. And so if there's anything you take away from this, I actually would say it's this question of like, if I were just completely alone in my life and I needed to move forward, what would be really exciting to me? And often you'll find it might be something very different than what you think you should be doing. And then it's also useful. So all of our emotions, again, are natural responses. And so sometimes your perfectionism is trying to protect you from something and it can be useful to explore what that is. So maybe it is that you think that if you don't show up in a certain way, you'll be punished or you won't be accepted. And so that's an interesting question to think through too. There might be structural issues that you want to push back against. There might be a relationship that's not the healthiest relationship. It might also be an expectation that you have created in your head that you should see if it's an assumption that's not necessarily true. So for example, I spoke to one woman and she said in her first job, she got in, she was the first person in the morning to get in and she was the last person to leave. And when she asked herself, like, what is this? Why am I doing this? Why am I at the office so much longer than anyone else? She was really worried about getting fired. So her perfectionism was trying to protect her from getting fired. And so she poked a hole in that assumption by talking to her manager and saying, you know, I've gotten here really early. Can you talk to me about what your expectations are around the hours when I need to be in the office? And her manager said, you definitely don't need to be here that late. Like, I would love for you to go home. It's really important to me, actually, that you have a healthy work-life balance. And so by testing that assumption, by going to her manager and asking, she was actually able to let go of some of those perfectionist tendencies because they were based on an inaccurate painting of the world. Um, so again, like, these are all questions just to think about and then to start to process, like, okay, what might be true? What might not be true? What can I do to make myself feel a little better? And then finally, if I meet this expectation, will I actually be protected from what I fear? 
So what this woman also said is she realized, so this is the woman who's going in early and leaving late. She said, as she looked around, she noticed that performance was really important, but being in the office around certain hours was not. And so coming in early, leaving late actually wasn't going to protect her from being fired as much as just like coming when it you know made sense and doing a really good job during those hours. So again, you can start to let go of some of these beliefs when you explore them more. But the first step was what I said earlier in the, in the previous section is just like acknowledging what you're feeling, giving yourself the permission to say like, this is the emotional state I'm in. And then starting to back into these questions and figure out like, okay, what's true, what's not, where can I go from here? Um, and again, a big part of this is just realizing that sometimes who you think you need to be is not necessarily who you can be, who you actually need to be. Um, and it can be really validating even to go to someone that loves you and say like, hey, can you just tell me that like, I'm enough? Like, it's nice to just be with me. Um, and that can be a really comforting thing to hear. So some other specific things, um, researchers often talk about replacing avoidance goals with approach goals. And so an avoidance goal is when I say like, I don't wanna fail this test. An approach goal is I'm gonna study and then I'm gonna see how well I do. And so one, I don't wanna fail is just like not an exciting goal, right? Like if I don't fail the test, I'm not going to throw myself, well, maybe <laughs> there's some situations where I might, but fundamentally, it's just like, even if I achieve that, it's not really exciting. But if I say like, who would I like, maybe I'll like an ace this, right? Like maybe I'm going to study really hard and I'll be happy no matter what happens, but let's see if I can get to a hundred and I'm going to feel good, you know, even if I get close, like that's a more exciting thing because it's not framed around failure. So in my own life, as an example, um, I used to have a really big fear on public speaking. And I still, like, I st I'm actually nervous now. <laughs> I still get like really nervous before any time I have to talk about anything. And so what I realized is that part of the anxiety there was because I felt like I had to do such a good job. And I realized that what I was telling myself was, I want to get up and not make a fool of myself. But again, like not make a fool of myself. Like even if I achieve that, it's not like worth celebrating. It's not really something that's exciting. And so I started to think, what would I say to people? Or like, what, like if I just, you know, was gonna get up and give a talk, if I just wasn't anxious, if I didn't have any expectations that I've created in my head, like, what would I wanna say to people? What would be like a natural conversation with a friend? And that was much more fun because then it became like, oh, this is actually just a conversation with a lot of other people. Um, and so that was an approach goal, which just like took the pressure off, made me more excited about working on it. Um, and also like made me much more creative. Like our creativity is very constrained when we're operating from a place of anxiety. Another one is just to recognize when good enough is good enough. Um, so not everything needs to be perfect. Perfect doesn't even exist. Like if you asked me what a perfect day is and you asked someone else, we would probably have really different views of a perfect day. Um, I'm more indoorsy. I have friends who love to be outdoors. So already like there's very different perfect days. Um, so understanding like there is no actual perfect. And so maybe turn that draft in or like get some feedback on it when it's at 80% or, you know, you don't need to excel in every single part of life, like understand when it's just good enough to like show up, do a decent job and then relax. Remembering that if something is worth doing at 100%, it's worth doing at 20%. And so this is like, this has been such a valuable one for me. So um, I like sort of the clearest example I can think of is exercising where I would often think like, oh, I need to exercise every day or I'm not healthy or like I had all these expectations around it. And now I'm like, you know what? It's just good to move your body. I feel better afterwards. And so even if I don't run like a mile, if I just walk around, like I walk around the block, that's still worth doing. It's useful to get some sunshine. It's useful to go outside. It's useful to like get the blood pumping. And so I don't need to do a hundred percent, which is like sprint for a mile, but it's still worth doing that 20%. And so again, if it's like, you know, oh, I wish I had a day to myself when I could just relax and not have to worry about anything, it's still worth doing that at 20%. So can you find an hour to do that? Can you take a bath? Can you read a book? Can you do something that really helps you invest in self-care? The words always and never, 
I hate them. Get rid of them. They're in just their signs that you're thinking very in black and white terms. So usually when you're saying always or never, you're lying to yourself. So common things I've heard as I was speaking with people are like good moms always are like radiant in front of their kids. Um, great students never get lower than a 90% on a test. And so those just are not true statements. Like I'm a mom. I'm not always radiant in front of my child. <laughs> like I'm often tired um, and cranky. I think I was a decent student. I definitely got lower than 90%. Um, I, you know, bombed many tests, bombed many assignments because I just like didn't know what to do. And then I figured out how to improve. But those are just not true statements. And they're clear signs that your perfectionism is rearing up. So when you find them, put a pin in it and say like, is this actually true? Probably not. People have bad days, no matter who they are. And then the last piece of advice that's been really helpful to me is naming your inner perfectionist. So um, many times there's like a voice in your head that's telling you all these perfectionist things. So that like, you know, you have a little voice and all of a sudden it says like, good moms never do that. Good moms always do that. Or like a good, you know, a person like worth loving always shows up in a certain way. And so when you start to hear those voices, actually giving them a name. Um, so names that I've heard are like some someone named there's Bozo to really make it like, this is just goofy talk. This is not actually an accurate picture of the world or like how I want to show up. And so anytime they hear themselves saying like, you know, great, I don't know, like great students always do X. It's just like, okay, Bozo's just saying stuff. I don't need to listen to it. Um, other people call them like Darth Vader to really paint it as like, this is like bad stuff that's not positive for me. So I definitely shouldn't listen to it. Um, so whatever it is, I think giving those voices or that voice a name is helpful in just distancing yourself from it a little bit and feeling better. Okay, so the next section is all about navigating uncertainty. Um, and I, yeah, I definitely <laughs> struggle. I, like everyone, I like to know what's going to happen. I like to have a plan, um, probably more, a little more than some other people. Um, and so when things are uncertain, when it feels like the future is up in the air, that's very anxiety inducing for me. And so here are a couple of things that have helped. Um, so I actually first want to start with a couple of myths. So again, for the second book, um, I interviewed about 1,200 people from all around the world, all different ages, from different backgrounds, like really tried to get a super diverse group. And a couple of myths, like, so these are a lot of beliefs that people held that are really inaccurate. And the first is the fundamental idea that you can ever know what's going to happen. Um, I have a very good friend who was like an incredible athlete. He was vegan. He ate like plant, but it was like very healthy, like any healthy thing. He had done it and knew all about it. Um, and at 32, he was diagnosed with bone cancer and had his leg amputated and had to go through a lot of chemo. And that basically happened. Like he had pain in his leg and then he got this diagnosis two weeks later. Um, and so it felt like overnight, he was also somewhat ironically, actually a cancer researcher. And so he was out of every single person in my life. Like he was the last person that I ever would have thought this would happen to. Um, and so, you know, that's like a sort of the most extreme example, but I think it does get to this deeper point of like, the truth is you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And so there's, that's very stressful. And it's also somewhat liberating. Once you realize like you can't control tomorrow, you can't ultimately control every piece of like the next week and the next month and your whole life path. There are going to be things inevitably that pop up and like derail you. Um, I definitely never thought I was going to be a barista at Starbucks. And then it was this amazing learning experience for me. So letting go of that, I think is actually really powerful. So yes, uncertainty is inevitable. The second one is that the anxiety you feel when you can't accurately predict what's going to happen is an indication that something bad is going to happen. Um, so humans hate uncertainty. There's actually a lot of research that shows that people would rather know for sure that something bad is going to happen tomorrow than have a 50% chance of that bad thing happening tomorrow. And that's because when you know something bad is going to happen, you can plan for it. You feel like you're in control, even if you're not. It's just like, okay, there's a thing that's going to happen and I can start to put things in place to like feel better about it. 
But if you're not sure, you suddenly have to like entertain all these different scenarios. And that's really stressful because suddenly you're planning for like 60 different things as opposed to just one. But it's really important to understand that just because you feel anxious about something doesn't mean that it's a guarantee that something bad is going to happen. Um, so I do believe in intuition. So this is not like you should never trust your gut, but it's just useful to check that emotion. So concrete example, I really hate getting my blood drawn. Like I have a massive phobia. I've passed out many times and I actually went to therapy for that. And one of the things that the therapist worked on with me was realizing that the anxiety I felt around this did not accurately reflect the risk of getting my blood drawn. It's actually like an extremely low risk procedure. And so the fact that I would get so like freaked out about it, like I would sort of even subconsciously interpret that as like, oh my gosh, I'm going to die. Or like, this is just such a horrible thing that happened to me. And so I like, it's, it's kind of hard to explain, but even just understanding like, yes, I'm feeling anxious, but that doesn't mean I'm going to pass out. That doesn't mean that this is a bad thing that's happening to me was really useful and actually lowered the anxiety. So there's tons of research that shows if we have a certain emotion that feels hard, like anxiety, if we pile on judgment or pile on, you know, more anxiety that actually makes us feel worse versus just saying like, I'm feeling anxious. I'm going to listen to that. I'm going to explore it, but I'm not going to see it as like a hundred percent because I'm anxious. This horrible thing is going to happen. Um, and so again, this is like very much based on my life experience <laughs> that sometimes there's a problem and my anxiety about the problem is just like, I entertain so many horrible situations that could happen. And then usually none of them happen. Um, and again, same with, you know, in reverse, like just being really nervous about something coming up the next day. Yes, sometimes bad things do happen, but it's useful to be like, just because I'm nervous today doesn't like, I, I shouldn't see that as fact that something bad is going to happen tomorrow. And then the last piece here that I think is really, really important to emphasize is that I've heard often, you know, I'll, I'll speak about work, but I think this shows up in our personal lives and in school as well, is that when someone is like, oh, I'm really struggling or I feel a lot of anxiety, sometimes people will be like, oh, you just need to be more resilient. Like resilient became this buzzword in 2020 when the pandemic first hit. And I think resilience is basically good. It means that you're able to adapt to change, um, that you can kind of like go through something hard, but still pick yourself up the next day and keep moving forward. But it's not like it, it shouldn't ever be used as quiet down. You shouldn't even be struggling. You just need to be more resilient. So I'm just here to say, like, if you have uncertainty, if you, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in your life, like one of your loved ones is sick, um, you are worried about what your future looks like. Those are very stressful situations. And so if you're anxious, it's not that you should feel bad about that. It's not that there's something wrong with you. It's that you're experiencing a very normal response to an anxiety inducing situation. And again, I think it's such an important message to hear that of like, there's nothing wrong with your emotions. Like they can feel really challenging. They can feel hard, but I don't believe in negative emotions. They're just responses to what's going on around you. And they're important signals that you should listen to. Okay. So a couple tips. The first is to stop anxious fixing. So this is kind of what anxious fixing looks like. I very much suffered from this. I sometimes still do. You get up in the morning, you're anxious because things are uncertain because there's something on your mind. And instead of sitting down and walking through those steps, I've you know, detailed, which is like, what am I feeling? What should I do with it? How can I move forward? You start doing all kinds of stuff because it just feels good to do stuff. So for me, that looked like cleaning. I would get up and instead of exploring what I was feeling and understanding what was really causing my anxiety, I would just fill my day with things. I would do the dishwasher. I would vacuum. I would put stuff away. I would like walk around the block. I would clean again. I would vacuum again. Like my house or my apartment was immaculate, but I never felt better. Actually, at the end of the day, I felt exhausted because I had done so much stuff without addressing the root of the problem. So now when I'm anxious, this is hard, it's uncomfortable. Like I really resist that urge to just do a bunch of stuff. And I sit down and I say, again, what is driving this anxiety and what can I do about it? The next is to adopt this mantra of I am a person learning to. So um, 
yeah, so I, I think what would have been really useful for me at many times in my life is to reframe what I was going through, through this lens. So like I said, I went to a small middle school and then went to Glenmard West and that transition from really small middle school to large public high school was like a lot of people knew each other and I didn't know anyone as well was really hard on me because I just thought that I had to show up on day one and have a ton of friends. And the fact that I didn't made me feel like a failure. And if I had said to myself, like, I'm a person learning to navigate a new space, to make friends in a totally new environment where other people have already had friendships for like the last 10 years to just like, you know, have a new routine to be a freshman in a big school. I think that would have been a very different experience than being like, I have to be perfect on day one. And why don't I have any friends? Like it's, you know, 845 after first period, where are all my friends? That's just not a realistic view of the world. And so this isn't going to solve all your problems, but it does allow you to give yourself grace and it allows you to kind of adopt a better mindset of like, I'm a person learning to go through this really hard transition and I'm going to have bad days and that's going to feel really challenging at times. And that's part of the process. So what can I do to kind of learn how to navigate it more effectively? And then finally, making a plan from which you'll deviate. So again, keeping in mind that you will never perfectly predict the future. And so what's your plan, but what might go wrong? What if that plan doesn't work out? What if, you know, you plan to like do a certain series of things over the weekend and then all of a sudden, you know, Saturday morning you wake up and you don't feel so good. What might you do then? And so you don't have to, you know, prepare for all these eventualities, but it's really useful, I think, just to say like, this is the plan from which I might deviate, or this is the plan from which I will deviate, which is again, acknowledging that things shift, unexpected stuff comes up. Um, the best leaders I've ever worked with in a work context have always said like, yeah, you should have an outline of what you want to do and you should have some stuff prepared. Like there, you definitely should have some kind of plan, but you are inevitably going to deviate from it because there's no way that we can predict now where we're going to be in six months. And we also are going to learn a lot along the way. So you want to be able to be flexible enough to say like, hey, you know, it's Saturday morning. I wanted to go to the beach tomorrow, but I'm really loving just lying in bed. So I'm actually not going to go to the beach because I've learned something new about my preferences. So I'm going to update my plan. And then finally, understanding your unique uncertainty tolerance. Um, and so this is, there are going to be different times in your life when you are willing to take on different levels of uncertainty. Um, so for example, I have a baby. I am pretty risk averse. I'm just like not as un like not ready to be have like as much uncertainty in my life as I used to be. So in my early 20s, I was fine, you know, moving from one apartment to another. It was fun to travel. It was fun for a while too, not exactly to know where I was going to do for work. And now I just want like to know where I'm going to sleep. I want to have a house I can decorate. Like it's just a very different time in my life. Um, and we also have sort of fundamental baselines of how much uncertainty we feel safe with. So you might be someone who's like, I loved, you know, I think a good, a good question to ask yourself is if you had like a trip, you're going on a trip, are you the person that needs to know exactly what you're going to do each day? Or are you like, let's book a plane ticket. Who knows? Who knows where this week is going to take us? We might not even be in the same country by the time the week is over. Um, and so my whole life, I have liked to plan. <laughs> so I'm not that into uncertainty. I have friends who are the exact opposite. And so it's useful to know that about yourself so that you can also like make decisions that will help you feel more comfortable. Um, so I make plans. I like plans. I make them. They help me feel more uncomfortable, more comfortable. Um, I have friends who do the opposite because they just, that's their preference. So again, it's just the self-awareness. There's not good. There's not bad. One is not like, you know, better than the other. It's simply who you are, what you prefer, and then how you can kind of shape your life to, to feel good. Um, I'm going to end on some questions to ask yourself. Um, cause I know we wanted to leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions from all of you. Um, so things to ask yourself when you are feeling anxiety and especially when the future feels uncertain. And the first is, am I catastrophizing? So I, again, as you can tell, like a lot of this is just based on what I've experienced in my own mind. Um, I am really creative about coming up with the exact like worst possible scenario. So one question that someone actually recommended is like, hey, when you're nervous about something, 
just ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen? And it probably won't be that bad. Um, for me, it's really bad, right? Like for me, the worst thing that could happen always ends in like me dying or like me getting really sick or someone I love dying. Like it gets intense, right? It's like a very quick down into the dark, dark depths. <laughs> and so that is not a useful question for me. Like just imagine the worst thing that could happen is not helpful to me, but it is helpful to say like, what is the likelihood that this thing will happen? It's usually really, really small. And so flagging that you're catastrophizing, I think even just saying like, okay, this is where my mind is going. I am catastrophizing helps you distance yourself a little bit from that train of thought. So it's not about judging yourself for it. It's not even about saying like that thing definitely will not happen because it could. It's about saying like, most likely that thing's not going to happen. And you also don't need to just like believe that this is fact and you can kind of distance yourself and pull away and maybe refocus on something else. It's also really useful to say like, what's the best possible scenario? So it might be helpful to say what's the worst thing that could happen. But again, you really want to go that approach goal, right? So reframing like, yes, I'm scared that this bad thing could happen, but like, what's the opportunity here? What's really awesome? Like in uncertainty, there's a lot of scary stuff, but there's also a lot of amazing stuff that could happen. So if you just move to a new city, the worst thing is that you deeply regret it. You have no friends, you never want to live there. The best thing is that it's like the greatest place you've ever lived. And maybe you have these amazing people that you just never want to live without again. Um, and it actually is, ends up being like the best decision you've ever made. And so I think it's just nice to think of that question to balance out, especially if you're like me and you tend to focus on like the very, very, very worst thing. It's really helpful for me to be like, okay, step back from that. Now let's look at like the other end. Also, this is like the best thing also probably isn't going to happen, but it just helps you kind of get a better sense of like, what is the full range of possibility in front of me? And then what's the most likely scenario? So again, this concept of likelihood of like, yes, there's really bad things that could happen. Like there's also like, I could win a billion dollars in the lottery tomorrow, but most likely tomorrow I'm going to have like a great day and maybe not great, a good day <laughs> and, you know, like go to my job, have a good time, see my friends. Um, and so it's it's just really useful, again, to kind of map out, like, here's all the different things that could happen. And I think, at least for me, it's really helped stop me from obsessing over the bad things, which then reduces my anxiety. Um, I had a last section here on burnout that I'm actually going to skip just in the interest of time. Um, so if there are specific questions about burnout, I'm super happy to address those. But I actually think it's more important to see if there's any questions from the audience. I think also um, Sophie and Haley... Ali, I hope I said that right, um, had some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my slides uh, and we can get to those. And again, like I said, if anyone does want me to quickly comment on burnout, I'm very happy to do that. Liz, I'm now on 10 pages of notes from your <laughs> conversation. I, I really thank you so, so much. I know everyone has enjoyed it. I'm already getting emails about it. Let's go to some questions, okay? Um, well, you know what, let's take one from Mike Niebers, who I believe was your guidance counselor. Yes. Um, at Boulevard West. Um, I, Mike, thanks for listening in. Um, how, how would you convince an adolescent that living up to a social peer perception or standard isn't as important as they think it is? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to thank Mike Niebers. Um, he was my guidance counselor at Glenbard West, so thank you. Uh, and one of the things I actually touched on in the last se section about burnout is just the importance of like seeking out connections. And my neighbors was just really helpful in helping me apply to college, think through my career. And honestly, I did not expect to like find solace in the office of a guidance counselor at Glenbard West. And I have a really vivid memory of those conversations just being so helpful, like feeling heard, feeling supported. Um, so again, I just like really want to emphasize to anyone, I think giving people a chance, just like reaching out for help, being open to those conversations, like they can be really, really impactful in your life. Um, so the question, let me get to this question. Yeah, living up to a social peer perception or standard isn't as important as they think it is. Um, I think, so two things. One, I think it's it's really people are usually convinced by stories more than statistics. 
And so sharing maybe a story from your own life of, hey, you know, when I was in high school, I thought X or even often I feel like I have to show up in this other way, but that's actually not why people care about you. And then the other thing I would say is emphasizing or like trying to figure out what they think makes them special and unique and then really leaning into that. So if I find that a high schooler feels like, you know, they they need to like dress a certain way, I might, or like behave in a certain way, I might actually say like, hey, like, what do you, what do you love to do? What do you feel like makes you special? What makes you different from everyone else? And then every time I see them, I would try to lean in on that. Like if they just love to play, I don't know, like the oboe or the accordion or something, you know, I might be like, hey, how's the accordion going? Like, I just think it's so cool that you play that. And so I think it's, again, creating this knowledge for them that like, again, I, I really, I think on both sides, we tend to underestimate how big of an impact a seemingly small action can have. And like mm-hmm. over and over in my life, I have had this, like, I remember, yeah, just times when I've been like really down or just going through a hard time and someone that like doesn't even know me that well was just like hey you seem kind of sad I just want to like say I'm here for you if you ever want to talk and I never like I remember this person and they I never took them up on that and that still like I still remember that like it just meant so much to me that someone like saw me for what I was going through and cared enough to say something and so I think even if it's just like hey you know like you told me you love the accordion like I haven't seen, I haven't heard you talk about it or like, you know, I, I just emphasizing that they are special for everything that makes them unique. Um, I think that can go a long way and then not under, yeah, not undervaluing really just like being there and listening to someone. Um, so yeah, it's so cool that you're here. And I just, yeah, I just really, yeah, I, I really appreciated all the guidance in high school. It meant a lot. I'm sure he's really appreciates hearing that too. Thank you so much. Okay, Haley, let's go with your question. You are up next. Hi, Liz. Um, so my question for you is being a person that has struggled with perfectionism, even though I am definitely not perfect, nobody is, but um, I have noticed that as I've gotten older and have become more involved with extracurricular clubs, service projects, athletics, academics, my perfectionism has actually gotten worse because my personal identity has become like intertwined with everything that I do and been involved in. So I was wondering, do you have any advice on how to manage these pressures and or change this mindset? Yeah, I would say two things. The first is to reconnect with why you're doing something. So I really love to draw and I have like built up this big following on Instagram. And there are definitely times when I post something and I'm like, oh my God, it needs to get this amount of likes or it needs to get this amount of comments. And if it doesn't, it sucks. Um, And so it's really, sometimes I just actually just shut that out. Like I, like I put my phone away and I say like, I'm not even going to look at this for another two days because it's not productive. And fundamentally why I like to draw is because it gives me lightness. I just love to do it. Um, And so I think reminding yourself of like, um, oh, I think there's a spam comment that we probably want to get rid of. Oh, thank you. yeah. I just want to make sure that we kick that person out. Um, So yeah, uh, making sure that, um, yeah, you just reconnect with why you're doing something. And then the other piece I'll say is, I think it's really valuable to continue to have something that's just for you. And I know that that's really hard in an environment where like maybe you're thinking about applying to college or you get so much, um, I think we often get rewarded or we get like recognized for things that are like that we're doing publicly but having something that you can go back to um, that you just do for yourself. So for example, I love to illustrate. A lot of that now has become part of my job. And so I still do like little painting that I never show anyone. And I do it like up in my attic and it's purposefully just for me because it reminds me of like, this is just me existing in the world, putting something out. And that's really meaningful. Um, So I think one is like reminding yourself, like, I don't know if it's sports that you just love the sport, Um, or that you love the teammates and like something that's not tied to like specific achievements or numbers or accomplishments. And then keeping like something small that's protected. And that can also be like a relationship or like a pet or something like that, that really is just, it's just there. And it's just fun to have it no matter if anybody else knows about it or cares. 
Great, thank you so much. Shannon, you're up next. There we go, okay, sorry, I couldn't get it to work for a second. Okay, so for the students that aren't here, what advice would you give them? Like if you could talk to all of the students at all of the Glenbards right now, if you had them all sat in a room, what would you tell them? Yeah, um, I would say, like don't underestimate how much your moods can change. Um, I think one of the things when I was younger, so I, I did, I, I, during high school, I had definitely like a year where I was very depressed. Um, and I remember feeling like nothing would ever get better. And honestly, it didn't for a while. Um, and so, but like now I think what's, what's been, what's useful about having lived longer, even I would say, is just like, sometimes I wake up and I have a really bad day or I feel really down and I'm like, I'm having a bad day. And that's okay. I could have a bad, or I have, I could have a good afternoon, or I could have a good tomorrow. Um, and so I, I think it's like life is long. Honestly, high school is short. It certainly doesn't feel like that. And I think when you're in a really like dark place or a hard place, it's it's excruciating. Like it really feels endless. Um, but starting to be more accepting of like you know, moods are kind of like weather, like sometimes they can go away and sometimes it'll be stormy for a longer time, but just like doing one small thing or like trying to say like, I'm gonna do one thing today to maybe help myself feel better. I'm gonna like find one thing that gives me hope. Um, I just like, I, I think you can go through, ex and I've seen like in my friends in my own life, like I think you can go through really, really hard moments and hard times and those can last for like years and you can still like be in a good place later on. Um, so I just like, don't lose hope around that, even if it's like a tiny glimmer. And then the other thing is just like, I think there's just, again, it's this like giving yourself permission, um, not beating yourself up for it, asking for help when you need it. I think it is so, so courageous to ask for help um, because it's like still somewhat stigmatized by some people. So yeah, I think it would just be like, I truly was like, I had a really hard year in high school and I can say like, the, and this is not to brag or anything, but like, I really like my life, <laughs> you know, and I still have like moments when it's hard and I have like days when I feel terrible, but you know, and like, even, even in, like, I look back and I still have like some good memories from high school. There are still like amazing people that I still have in my life. Um, so yeah, I think that's what I would say. Thank you for that. There, before we get to Sophie's question, there's a, there is someone who's saying, help, I'm feeling very burned out. Can you share some thoughts for me? Yeah, um, I think a lot of, so what I would say about burnout is two things. One is like learning, like finding small moments in your day that are just for you. So one of my friends, what she does is she says like over lunch, she steps away from her phone, she steps away from her computer, and she just reads like mag like Us Weekly, like gossip magazines, because that's really fun for her. And it's like a thing she does for herself. And it's 30 minutes over lunch, but that is like really re-energizing to her. Um, and the other thing I would say is like making time for something called garbage time. So this is time that we often like tend to judge ourselves for. And the story I'll share is there's an author called Brene Brown. She's written a lot about vulnerability. I highly, highly recommend her work if people haven't heard of her. And she shared the story where she was working on her latest book and she, she had writer's block. So she just like couldn't write anything. So she asked her husband to take their kids away to the in-laws for a three-day weekend. And it's this huge production, right? Like the husband like he gets all their kids, he gets them in the car, he packs all this stuff. They go away for three days and Brene has the house all to herself to write. Husband comes back, you know, Sunday night and they get the kids to bed. He and Brene go and get into bed and he's like, what did you write? Like, I'm so excited to hear about all the words that poured out of your mouth, like that, that are on the page. And she says, yeah, so I watched 46 episodes of Law and Order SVU. Uh, and I didn't write a single word and he gets livid. Cause he's like, I took the kids, what is happening? Like this, this, this was not for you to binge watch TV by yourself on the couch. But what she finds is that in the days following that the writing just pours out of her. And so I think it's like, you need 
you need to binge watch the thing, right? You need to like do nothing for a weekend. You need to do all this stuff that we normally call garbage time because that's actually what's going to help you set up for a sustainable life. And so many times I hear people say like, I just, I can't, I can't fit it in. You can't like, I think it's loosening these expectations of like, you don't have to show up perfectly every day. Like there is some kind of like 30 minute block, some hour, some vacation you can put on the calendar um, that allows you to kind of reclaim more of that garbage time. That's just going to help you. Like, and I think it's also useful to reframe of like, I'm going to be a better mom. I'm going to be a better student. I'm going to be a better manager if I'm not completely burnt out. And so to actually be the kind of person I want to be for others, I need to take this weekend for myself. It's really beautiful advice. Um, and it reminds me that I was looking at the back of your book, um, these endorsements, and you have an endorsement from Susan Cain, the author who's been with us on Quiet. She's coming back on Bittersweet. And you have an endorsement from Dan Pink. They'll be in conversation about the book, Bittersweet. So everybody oh, come back. Isn't it, won't that be special? So just like tonight, really. Um, uh, Sophie, your question is up now, please. If you could go back to like your high school years and talk to your high school self, what will you want her to know now? Like what advice mm -hmm. could, if you could, what will you tell her now mm -hmm. that so many years have passed and you've learned so much? What would you tell her? Um, I think I would just say like, you're, you're okay. You know, I think there were times when I didn't know that I would be okay. Um, and I think it would have been really comforting to hear, like, it just turned out okay. You know, like, you, you got through it, and you feel good, and you felt bad again, but then you felt good again. Um, and I think there's a lot of, I think, again, it comes down to what I said earlier, which is just like, there's gonna be hard times in your life. And I think sort of just having this like deep knowledge that you can get through it and that there will be good times again is very comforting. So many of these wonderful illustrations, uh, a takeaway, success is not a straight line. And so just stay with it that you've done and explored this so beautifully in this book with these drawings. I'm so grateful to you for the time that you spent with us tonight. I know that the students who are listening in and will be students and the students who will be listening in this, um, you know, he who saves one life saves the world entire, Liz. And I think you've really done that tonight. So I'm so grateful. Thank you so, so yeah. very much. Thank We're going to encourage we're going to encourage everybody now tell with me, Liz, say stick around because you're going to hear about some opportunities for those of you with high school students about how they can get involved and make a difference in their community. Yes, there's the applause. Let's hear it for Liz. Thank you so much. A pleasure to Thanks host everybody. you tonight. Thank you. Okay, Shannon, take it away. Can we get the slides up really quickly? One moment. Yep, you're fine. Okay, so thank you for staying with us. I'll get through this part first. Um, so we have several opportunities for students to become involved in mental wellness um, and prevention. So if you are a student listening on this or you have students that are listening on this, um, this is a really great opportunity and it's super fun. Um, and so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about this. So um, Reality Illinois is the Teen Advisor Board teen advisory panel to the DuPage County Health Department, which is made up of high school students. A lot of them are Glenbard students, but we have students from really everywhere. Um, I'm across several schools who work to make a lasting impact on, li on the lives of youth. This is done through education and promoting policy change that reduce youth substance and tobacco use and increase mental wellness. Um, and if you're asking if we actually make an impact, we really do. We've seen this make an impact throughout our communities in so many different ways, and it's really an awesome program. Um, reality is a great way for students to strengthen their leadership and advocacy skills and make a positive impact in the community. So reality students, uh, they meet at the Glen Allen Park District or at the Carroll Stream Park District to pass out an ordinance to make all parks um, smoke free and also attending the signing of the Tobacco 21 law by Governor Pritzker. So if you're looking and see if we actually made an impact, we do make lots of impacts throughout different schools and districts. 
Um, so the group meets monthly during the school year um, and weekly during the summer doing different service projects. And it's always something new every week. So there's never something dull or never something boring. The summer schedule kids uh, kicks off on June 6th at 1.30 p.m. with a special philanthropy, philanthropy party. Um, so you can email Miss Ross, who is on this meeting, if you need her email. Um, I'm sure we can link it in the chat somehow if someone wants to do that. Sorry, I don't know how to do that. Um, but yeah, so reality is super important and we make a really big impact. So if you're looking for upcoming dates, our next slide has some upcoming dates. There we go. Um, so our next slide is, this just has a couple of dates that you might want to have your team come out to. So um, I'm a part of DuPage Action Team and Reality and we're running our color run. We have the Philanthropy Party that I had talked about. Um, and so we have a lot of different dates and stuff like that. And we'll have a more updated calendar as the year progresses a little bit closer to summer. Um, so if you're really just looking for a good time and a way to give back to the community and like make some change, I would really recommend doing this. I've made some really close friends by also doing this and it gives you a sense of purpose, honestly. Um, next slide, sorry. So as I mentioned, I am a part of the DuPage Action Team. So what are we? We are the teen ambassadors for mental health, substance use, and prevention and stigma reduction. So in addition, um, the Glenmore North High School students, so me, Sophie, and Haley, who are on this meeting, are all um, reality members. We're also DuPage Action Team members. Um, so any Glenmore High School student has the opportunity to become a DuPage Action Team student ambassador as well. So a little bit of what we do is on the next slide. Thank you. Um, so a little bit what we do is we are team volunteers for District 87. So we work with all of the Glenbards. We do substance use prevention, mental health, wellness, and stigma reduction and um, for peer support ambassadors. So we are all certified in mental health um, first aid for teens, which is actually really fun and honestly a great like strategy, like a great thing to have because there's not enough um, people that are educated enough to be able to help other students out. So we're happy to help the people out within our own communities at our schools. So our goal is to reduce the stigma associated with substance use and mental wellness. Um, we do have a link to apply. I'm sure someone, if you wouldn't mind posting that link in the chat. Um, we are currently open for applications. Many of us are seniors this year and we cannot continue what we're doing once we go to college because we'll be out of state. Um, but we are looking for anyone who is a freshman, sophomore, or junior this year. And it's really just an awesome opportunity. I'm going, I'm going to Springfield in two weeks to talk to the senators about having a team like ours be put into every single public school district. Um, and that's really just to be able to create as much change as we possibly can. So if you want your kid to be involved or you or yourself and you are a student, if you want to be involved, this is such a great way to get involved, not only with your school, but also with your community. And we do so many good things. And honestly, my heart is so full from the things that we do. So I would just say, if you're at all interested, we host a lot of meetings that you can pop into, or we're having um, some meetings coming up soon for like introduction for new people. So if you're interested at all, please come out. We'll tell you and answer any questions that you have. I can answer any questions right now if anyone has any questions, but it's really such an awesome opportunity. And I cannot stress that enough. Outstanding. Thank you so much. You know, all of our GPS speakers talk about the importance of having students have lives that matter um, and giving back and having a voice. And so I really appreciate all of those of you who are still here. Um, if you are looking for information in your own school, your child's own school building about how they can get involved, I'm happy to take that question and bring it forward to that particular school. Perhaps there's a wellness club, a students for students club, a SAD chapter, students against destructive decisions. So feel free to please do email me guild underscore Ross at glenbar.org. If you are a student, uh, have a child who lives in DuPage County, and you'd like to be a part of Reality Illinois, the teen board, please, please do join us at our monthly meetings or weekly in the summer, as Janet just described. If you are a Glenbard parent and you're child might be interested in becoming a student ambassador, part of the DuPage action team, then please also do email me. There is an application that's associated with that. So lots of ways to get involved. And we always say, just give us a try. 
um, invite your child to come out, uh, Rielli, Illinois, for example, um, you'll always have a good time and you'll learn about other opportunities to take it further like the DuPage Action Team. So special thanks to Liz tonight uh, for her really, truly, truly important words, her beautiful artwork. Thanks to all of those who are still listening. Thank you to our amazing teen ambassadors. Thank you, Jerrica and everybody. This is where we go hug our kids. So we're going to do that those of us that are adults. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great evening. See you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.